Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm Dr. Kate Boyd, and I'm a professor of piano at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I'm here to help you take your playing to the next level. This video is about how to learn a new piece from the ground up. I actually had the idea to make this video because I showed my system to several of my new students last semester, and honestly, they have been completely changed pianists as a result. They're learning music much more efficiently, much more effectively, and their self-confidence at the piano has gone through the roof because they realize that actually they're making significant progress every single day at the piano. And so I'm really excited to show the system to you today. In this video, I'm gonna go through my system and I'm gonna show you how I apply it to learning a brand new piece myself. To illustrate this, I picked a piece that's brand new to me. It's a beautiful barcarolle by the romantic French composer named Mel Boni. If you wanna follow along, I've put a link to the sheet music in the description and I'm gonna provide the version that I annotate over the course of this video so you can follow along. Now, I love acronyms because they make things easier to remember. And so, because learning a brand new piece can be somewhat stressful, the acronym I use here is STRESS, which is really actually the opposite of what the system does. It's designed to alleviate stress from the early stages of learning a new piece. So my system, the anti-stress system, has six points to it. Each point correlates to a different letter in the word STRESS. The first letter is S and it stands for sections. It's important to divide the piece into sections as your very first step. And what I mean by sections is this piece is eight pages long, so I'm gonna estimate that I'll probably divide it into between three and 10 sections. The way that I'm gonna divide it into sections is I'm going to listen to it, and then I'm gonna hear where the music seems to start a brand new section. And that will often correlate to when the texture changes or when the patterns change in the music. And then what I'll do is I'll make a vertical line in the score as I listen to it. And then when I'm done, I'll see at the end how many sections that created. I'll be right back. All right, so I've divided this piece into eight sections. In order to figure out how long to make the sections, you have to find the length that feels appropriate for you. It should feel like a manageable amount of material. If you're looking at one section of the piece and you just feel totally overwhelmed, that's just a sign that you need to break it down into more sections. You can have as many sections as you want in a piece or a movement. I personally find it a little overwhelming if I'm starting a new piece and there are like 50 sections to learn. So to me, eight feels like a very manageable number. One really useful thing about listening to a piece first is that it helps you get a sense of the overall structure of the piece. As I like to say, listening to a piece before you learn it is like looking at the picture of the puzzle on the box before you do the puzzle. It's not cheating to listen to it before you learn it. You do not need to worry that you're gonna be in the position of imitating the interpretation the artist did on the recording because you don't even know the piece yet. If you are concerned about getting locked into a single interpretation of the piece before you've learned it, then I recommend listening to about three different recordings of your piece back to back. That will prevent you from getting too attached to any one performance and imitating what somebody else did. So long story short, it's totally safe and a very good investment of your time to listen to the piece at least once while following along in the score before you start learning it. Oh, and also I've numbered my measures and that's always the first thing you should be doing too in cases when a score doesn't already have measure numbers written into it. The second letter in the system is T which stands for take it from the end. The reason that I always start a piece from the end is because psychologically it is so helpful. As you play it nearing the end, it gets more and more familiar instead of less and less familiar. It also builds in this extra level of security that's just irreplaceable. Another reason it's important to start at the end is because usually the harder stuff is toward the end of the piece and so you want to tackle that earlier in the process of learning so you have more time to get comfortable with it. You don't want to do something like play and learn the first page, get really, really good at it, and then turn the page and have the next thing be really hard and then get intimidated. Instead, start from the end because then it's easier to keep exploring backwards closer and closer to the beginning of the piece. Now I have my eight sections. So I'm putting number one at the end and going backwards marking each section that I previously decided back to number eight at the beginning. The third letter in my system is R, which stands for repeat until comfortable. So you're gonna work from the last section and you're gonna choose a chunk from the end that makes musical sense, like a musical gesture of some kind, and you're gonna repeat it correctly multiple times. What this is, 
is drilling. This is crucial to the learning process. Now, a quick word about the number of reps to do when you drill. The number I recommend doing is between five and eight. What you're looking for is feeling that something in your hands is kind of changing as a result of the reps. So when you drill and you do these repetitions, you will feel like, oh yeah, now it's starting to sink in. Now I'm ready to move on to another fragment. This is how I'm gonna start drilling my new piece. My first section starts at 88 and goes to the end. However, I'm not just gonna start at 88 and play through to the end because there are many, many fragments I need to learn before then. That's like way too much information for my brain. So I'm gonna start in measure 108 and just look at the last four measures. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just play it hands together. So I looked at it and as you noticed, I didn't try to force myself to play it in tempo. What I did was I played it and gave myself time to find each and every note. Now I'm noticing that the way that this is set up would benefit from playing it in blocked chords. So I'm gonna play two notes at a time in the right hand. And then new hand position here. So that's how that is set up. It's just all blocked. So I'm gonna drill it blocked. I'm not even gonna play it as written. I'm gonna do this. This is my second repetition. Okay, I missed that C flat, so I'll get a little bit of a running start. Just going over that a couple times. Okay, so that's my done it three times, and I'm just keeping track in the margins because I forget if I don't write it down. I'm gonna go for six times. That's how many I typically need to feel comfortable. I missed that C flat again. Let me just do right before it. C flat. my fourth time. You can notice that I'm naturally increasing the tempo just a little bit. It's not really a conscious thing as much as it is my fingers are ready to find the notes a little bit faster. Now I'm going to play it as written. So that's my first fragment. Now I'm gonna go backwards and I'm gonna look at the texture and it looks to me that the te texture changes in 105 where it says Calmato. I'm gonna look at that. Now what I notice here is that the right hand is gonna take two notes of the melody each time. So I'm marking that into my music. That's my first real rep. I'm also not deciding completely yet about my fingering. I'm playing it a few times to see what feels intuitive. It's my second rep. Now this is the third repetition to go to G. review the other little snippet. Right, so 
you can see it it takes a long time to drill really well it also pays off in big dividends it's important to be methodical and to work back in little chunks that are something that make musical sense to you and that you can then retain as you do repetitions i'm not going to obviously bore you by doing reps all the way back to my number one which is the first section but the idea is that you break up the section into small units like that and then you build them together and then you eventually get back to one and then you practice playing that to the end several times the next letter is e which stands for excellence matters the fact is the quality of your repetitions is super important it's crucial that each and every repetition is high quality and correct you know the phrase garbage in garbage out this applies to your practice too if you only remember one thing from this video remember this excellence matters all reps are not created equal let's say you're playing basketball and you've decided you want to improve your accuracy on free throws having articulated that goal to yourself you certainly wouldn't just half-heartedly chuck the ball in the general direction of the basket if you really wanted to see results you'd focus on your form and try to improve it each time so it's important not to just do a bunch of reps. You need to make effort to do it correctly each time, learn from the previous repetition, and improve it for the next repetition. Here's what it sounds if I do a low quality rep of what I did earlier. So what I'm doing is I'm missing notes, I'm playing inaccurate rhythms, I'm not using the pedal to keep it smooth, I'm not paying any attention to my voicing. You get the idea, right? I'm gonna do a high quality rep to show you the difference in terms of looking for excellence. I'm paying attention to what voice I bring out. I'm paying attention to rhythm and correct notes. I took it at a tempo I could actually play. The fifth letter is S, which stands for hands separate. You are never too advanced to consider hands separate practice as a tool that can help you as you learn your music. Remember, the goal here for each of your fragments and reps is to find the optimal level of challenge. We also want to minimize wasted time in the practice room because I would much rather be outside the practice room doing something interesting than spending too much of it inside the practice room doing something tedious. And so I suggest that you start by trying to drill your sections hands together. And if you notice that it's really, really hard to play hands together, break it down and do your reps hands separately. If you can pretty comfortably play it hands together, don't waste your time playing it hands separately a whole bunch of times. But then if you play it hands separately, learn it so that it's quite fast and quite comfortable, go all the way up to performance tempo hands separately, then slow it back down and do it hands together. Here's how I would practice one of these little fragments hands separately. I'm gonna start in measure 99. First of all, I'm gonna start with the left hand. And then. And I would write in fingering. three, two, one, et cetera. And I would get it so that I could play the left hand pretty fast. And, then. and so what I'm doing is I'm getting it so that each hand is totally comfortable on its own. Then I would slow it down. Etc. I would then play it hands together slowly and then do six reps of that. The sixth letter is S, which stands for slow practice. The thing to keep in mind here is that if you are cognitively overloaded, you will not be able to retain what you're trying to learn. You need to feed your brain manageable chunks of information consistently with excellence so that it can retain this information in the sensory memory, take note of it in the short-term memory without being overwhelmed, 
and eventually move it to the long-term memory after a sufficient number of consistent, correct repetitions. The way I use slow practice in learning a new piece is to take it at a tempo where I won't make mistakes, and if I make a mistake, I go back and correct it immediately. You need to use your common sense and not waste a lot of practice time doing blanket slow practice in sections that don't need it. If you have a complicated figure preceded by something you can play quite easily, for example, don't bother repeating the easy thing tons and tons of times at a slow tempo because you can already play it. This is much, much more effective than blindly following a rule to play something a certain number of times with the metronome at a very slow tempo. A good way to determine whether you're practicing something at the right tempo is to notice the level of ease you feel while playing. If it's a huge effort to play all of the notes, then you probably need to slow down. If you can easily play it correctly, musically, and with good rhythm and tempo, and doing repetitions feels completely unchallenging to you and might even be boring, that's a sign it's probably a good idea to go ahead and move on to a new section. While practicing, it's important to find that Goldilocks level of challenge, something that's neither too hard nor too easy. So here's how I would apply slow practice to a fragment that I'm drilling. I'm gonna look at measure 99, and I'm just gonna show you a little piece of it, although the fragment goes all the way until 103. But I'll play it slowly, and the idea is to have a good rhythm and that I'm not missing notes. I'm taking a tempo where I'm not gonna miss notes. Etc. right, I'll do that, that section. But let's say that I couldn't do it at that tempo accurately, and instead the only way I could play it was like this. Okay, that's a sign that I need to do hand separate practice. That is not a good use of practice time. If you think of how long it would take for me to do those three measures, not only would it take a long time, but my brain is too overwhelmed by the sheer amount of information. And so it, I just won't retain it. And that's where you really get into trouble. That's where you start to feel like you're practicing and practicing and not making meaningful progress. So if that describes sometimes when you practice, then go back and learn the left hand. Now, if it's just impossible to play the left hand alone or the right hand alone, without great, great effort, then probably you need to work on something that's not quite as challenging for you, that's at an easier level, and then work up to the piece that you're trying to learn. You're gonna have more fun and ease and pleasure from playing the piano if you're playing pieces that are at the appropriate level for you. And you will continue to improve and evolve and eventually get to the point where you are ready to play the piece that was so challenging for you. If you're interested in how to learn a new piece at the piano, you'll also be interested in understanding the foundations of why this system works so well and how the brain processes a new piece when you start it. I made a whole video about that right here. Go ahead and click on that now to continue. I'll see you there and happy practicing.